Okay, so you can hear me right now. Is it all different to all of us? Go for it. So, uh, thank you for coming to my talk. My name is uh, Ahmed Salim. I work as a C++ developer at Microsoft, in which we develop software for um, automotive industry, specifically uh, ADA system and autonomous driving. So today's talk is about safe C++ because it's a very important topic when it comes to uh, automotive because it's uh, something we call safety critical domain. So let's start. So first of all, we have a definition of safety. So safety is about emitting unpredictability from the program. And that of course also increases level of security. So when we um, have a program, we should uh, have the ability to predict what the program is doing. Otherwise, um, the safety will go down. So increasing safety is by increasing and eliminating unpredictable uh, code or program construct. Another definition is uh, also uh, attached to security, which is if we increase um, the predictability, creating software that is free from constraint that lead to unpredictable behavior. So safety is also contributing to the security of the program. Okay. Another definition is very important from uh, Alexander Stepanov. So he says that understanding why software fails is important, but the real core challenge is understanding why software works. So it's very, very, very important to understand why our software works or how it works. <clears throat> And this will bring us to a very important thing, the core of the C++ language specification, which is called the C++ abstract machine. So how many of us uh, usually go and read the specification of the language, meaning go to the open standard and grab the latest definition either for C++ 14, 17, 20, 23? So can you raise your hands to see if you ever go to the specification, read it. No, no, what? At least CVP reference, correct? At least CVP reference. Okay, great. So <clears throat> in C++, we have something that is called the abstract machine. So the abstract machine is by definition, it's a portal abstraction of, of your operating system, kernel, and hardware. The abstract machine is an um, intermediary between your C++ program and the system that is run on. In other words, C++ programs des describe operations that are performed on the abstract machine, meaning that your C++ implementation defines the characteristics of the ab abstract machine and translate operation from the abstract, ma abstract machine into operation of the system. So when we think or reason about um, code construct, we should think how, sh how this code construct will be emulated on the abstract machine. So think of the abstract machine as the super reference of the language. We cannot leave it to the implementation tool. And when, when I mention implementation tool, I mean the compiler, okay? So implementation tool is a compiler, linker, optimizer also. And these guys are called the implementation tool. So we cannot leave everything to the implementation tool because the implementation tool also um, might have um, some bugs. So, there's, there must be something like a constitution that represents the C++ specification, and this is called the C++ abstract machine. <clears throat> so, when we write C++ code, the implementation tool, also known as the compiler, will take this C++ code and try to emulate it on the abstract machine for us, parsing and doing all of this magic stuff, and then convert it to a binary code and then we, we take this boundary code and run it onto the real machine, okay? Your computer, your car, whatsoever, your coffee machine, we run this code. <clears throat> okay? There is one point here. Your observable behavior of your program or code construct or any operation should match what should be done on the abstract machine. For example, if you reason about while your C++ code is behaving like this, 
irrespecting uh, or validating a bug or whatsoever or uh, a behavior that is strange, you also think how the implementation of the, C, uh, of the C++ specification is handling this. So uh, you're mentally in your mind, you actually try to emulate it on the abstract machine in, our, in order to reason about your code. <clears throat> and the abstract machine defining four categories of observable behavior. First one of them is, of course, that our uh, program is well formed a program, C++ program constructed according to the syntax rules, meaning that it is in well formed state and it behaves as expected. Second one is the implementation defined behavior, and this is very important. The behavior of the program varies between implementation. And the implementation here might be an architecture, um, operating system, implementation tool as well, or compiler. And all of them have a specific implementation that might vary from either one. An example is the size of the stood um, size T. For example, on ARM 32-bit processor, it's four bytes. On our x86 64-bit machine, it's eight bytes. So this is called implementation defined behavior. <clears throat> Another one, which is uh, also created, is unspecified behavior. That means your operation is unspecified, meaning that it varies between implementation, between different implementation. But it is correct. We frame program and construct and correct data. And the confirming implementation is not required to document the effect of each behavior, meaning that you won't find any documentation telling you why this is behaving like this, okay? This is what's called by unspecified behavior. An example, for example, if you go to the IEEE 7.5.4 and try to um, understand how to generate a floating point NAN, not a number, it is two types, quiet NAN and uh, signaling NAN, each one of them has a different pattern. For example, if we take the single floating point, we have 32 bits. Each of the 32 bits have a meaning, but it's different between architecture. For ARM on 80, x86, they are different. They are being handled different, but the implementation is not required to document this. That's what's called unspecified behavior, okay? And the first one is very important. We're going to talk a lot about this one because this behavior is very uh, annoying. It's called undefined behavior. This behavior for which this standard imposes no requirement. What does that mean? It means that the standard is telling you to create an object using this code construct, using this way. If you go the other way, it's not defined in the standard, okay? That's why it's called, it's not documented. So the standard imposes no requirement here. So you are on your own, actually. That's called, what is called by undefined behavior. And as, as an example of the undefined behavior <clears throat> is the access to an object through a pointer of a different type. This is undefined behavior. Access uninitialized uh, variable. Access an object outside of its lifetime. It's related to the previous one and access to a non-active member of unit, for example. All of these are considered undefined behavior. The specification didn't mention this. So if you're trying to do this, you know that you are on your own, meaning that you might run into uh, a bug, a crash. You might also uh, arrive to the end of, the, of your program safely. So there is a randomness here. What's also important about this undefined behavior is that your program is actually in undefined states. Whenever we encounter an undefined behavior, you cannot continue with your program execution. So it's very important to support your application because your application is actually from this point on is in undefined state. Okay, for example, segmentation fault is undefined state. Okay, the referencing an outputter is undefined state, undefined behavior. Compiler are not required to diagnose undefined behavior, meaning that uh, from the standard point of view, they are not required to help you here. They are not required to tell you, watch out, this is undefined behavior. Yet, there is uh, some help from the compilers. They give you, for example, uh, warning 
as we're going to see right now. So in this example, we have a dangling reference. Dangling reference, it's about the undefined behavior that is called accessing an object outside of its lifetime. So as we can see here in line five, in line six, sorry, that we have a dangling reference. Do you know why? Why we have a dangling reference? Or the question should be, do you see what? <laughs> can you see here? Anyhow, this is a stood min max, okay? This is a utility, standard library utility. You can use it. Or maybe, sorry, it's an algorithm, okay? Min max is an algorithm. We can use it. We can have the min max. We can send, for example, uh, two parameters, one and two, for example, in this, uh, in this example. And we should receive a pair, the pair that contains the min as a first and the max as a second, okay? The problem is that I am, for example, here sending one and two as the literals. These are should be bound to the interface of the min max that is a cone strap, okay? But the problem is that the returning type is also a pair of cone strap. So it will be here in the scope of the function, then x value, but nobody is materializing, is five times. So we are gonna have a dangling reference, a reference to something that does not exist, okay? Something similar to the dangling point. Here we can see that the warning, there is a warning from the building. You, you should build this, and the compiler will tell you that this is a dangling reference. By the way, this dangling reference warning is a recent one. It has come with GCC 13. So if you have an old compiler, you won't have it. So it's very important in safety to have your compiler updated because you're going to receive more new features like having uh, a new warning like this. This is very important. <clears throat> So accessing the dangling reference is undefined behavior. So according to the standard, there is no diagnostic should be issued here, but the compiler is helping you out, okay? So the second example is same thing, accessing an object outside of its lifetime because the pointer here to end has not started its lifetime. So we have start um, start, uh, start of lifetime by calling, for example, new. Okay, but in this example, it didn't. And then we can have a problem, and then we have a warning from the compiler just building the application. Will tell me that this is an initialized pointer to int. Okay, so the second part here, we're going to talk about types in C++ as a definition. So types in C++ or a type in C++ is an entity that is associated with our object. So our objects are uh, going to be uh, an instance of this type, as well as function references and expressions, which restricts the operations that are permitted on these entities. Okay, so the type determines this operation and provides semantic meaning of the otherwise gen generic sequences of bits. If you want type safety or seeking type safety, that means you should use the type in a safe way. And that means use the types correctly and avoid unsafe operation. Program constructs that alters incorrectly the type through, for example, reinterpret cost, okay? Affects the entities that are associated with this, for example, object lifetime, we can manipulate this wrongly and then we end up in also undefined states. <clears throat> so there are, uh, Generally, classification for types in C++, the fundamental one, the compound, and the class. Fundamental are the plain old data type, for example. We have eight load bool enums, but excluding pointer, of course. The compound are arrays, pointers, and references. In the class, union, start, and class. So union is a class of a class action, okay? And struct as well, uh, as well as a class, of course. Objects in C++ are associated with this type. When we allocate them, they're going to have a size. So it's very important property. Object, you have a size, storage, duration. The important whether it's automatic on the stat, static, dynamic, thread locally. And also it has lifetime bounded by the storage duration or temporary. For example, if I have um, a static variable with a global level of my file, then this is a static. Uh, storage 
That means it has a lifetime, a lifetime according to my uh, program duration. Otherwise, if I create it on the stack, then it has a lifetime according to the scope of the function on the stack itself. And also, object have uh, alignment value name, which is also known by identify. So, the very important thing here when we talk about safety, when we talk about safety, we have something called the object lifetime. C++ memory model of object management is based on object lifetime. So when we start the lifetime of an object, we create it and we initiate the constructor. And also we have the destructor when we end the lifetime of this object, specify the meaning of the object initialization and the structures behind the object, uh, so, and the structure defines the object in that. For automatic object, destruction is implicit executed at the end of the scope. For dynamic objects, of course, they are placed on the heap. So they have other techniques, for example, new, delete, or malloc, and free. Okay? Next, we're going to see uh, an example about the object lifetime. Of course, we have the new. Just to think about it, we have new and placement new, malloc, and free. So new and placement new are tools that can start the lifetime of object, but they are different. There is a difference between new and placement new. New is doing two things, okay? So it allocates and starts the lifetime and also calling the constructor, while placement new is doing only one thing. It just starts the lifetime of an object, meaning that it will call the constructor for us, but it's not going to allocate on the memory, okay? The same thing uh, with malloc and free. Malloc, on the same level they are. Malloc is allocating and free is are freeing. So free is not going to cause a destructor and malloc is not going to create a lifetime for me. So as, as an, um, an example here, as we can see, we have a struct called flow. And I'm trying to create this um, sequence manually that the new is going to do it for me. So and instead of calling new to create it on the heap, I am uh, calling malloc with a size, okay, because it allocates memory, and then I'm calling placement new. So placement new is not returning for me a pointer like new, but it is actually takes the pointer for me, so I should provide uh, an address to the new, to the placement new, sorry, in which it will create an object and start its lifetime. <clears throat> As you can see, the next thing, when I need to clean up, before freeing up this memory, I, I need to call the destructor to do the cleanup for me. Uh, and I'm calling it by uh, manually like this. You have to mute. That's an excellent question. Because here we have, as you can see, what's written here? What is this? Yeah. Yeah, I understand. I got the question. So instead of freeing that, ah, okay, sorry. So he mentioned that in LAN 12, we have a reinterpret cost to the parameter of F, but we are freeing F, but the, uh, the, the return of the reinterpret cost. But can we do it on the PF that is the return of the malloc? And actually, here it's quite, um, quite tricky. Because the reinterpret cost is a pointer re returned from the reinterpret cost. So this is a defined statement which I doubt, okay? Then I should be using this, not the other one, because the lifetime is allocated here, okay? So the lifetime is taking that into consideration. But since if free is actually just freeing the memory, then I can exchange it. So I believe they are exchangeable, but I put here undefined behavior because of something. The malloc returns a pointer to void, as you can see in line 11. Okay? And the reinterpret cost is reinterpret costing to a full pointer. So, what's the difference here between void and full? What's the difference between them? Okay? Yeah, Marcos, we didn't align it. Correct. Great. There's a problem with the alignment. As we have seen before, objects, they have aligned. Void with x86, 64-bit, they have 8-byte alignment requirement, okay? Because they are the world of the 
register, okay? Uh, but three, I don't know. Here, it has an int. So most of the is a limit of four. So this is undefined behavior, actually. But anyhow, I've added the, just the, aside from the undefined behavior, I put this example just uh, to see the start life of an object and the deletion and, uh, sorry, the cleanup and then the, the free of the, of, the, of the memory allocated. In C20 and 23, they have fixed this for us. Because in C20 and 23, we have two uh, features, which is implicit, explicit, manipulation of objects, which are created by the implicit um, type. There are uh, a set of type called implicit type. And I can have a library function that is called start lifetime as. So I give it a pointer. And I can create or resurrect an object by giving it a new birth in this memory. OK? So I, as if it's calling the new and the replacement new, and also assuming that the reinterpret cost from that point, from 20 and 23, it is going to be the full page. But in C++ 14, 17, it's not. OK? Next. So we are doing actually some use cases. In the automotive, in the automotive industry, we have what is called by uh, a software-defined vehicle. So we will take uh, you in a journey just to see um, a real now, a real uh, example, and how can we achieve uh, safety through this? Okay, just a glimpse of what software-defined vehicle, just to give you um, an overview how a vehicle is is running and requirement for a vehicle to run or software to run on a vehicle. So this is a modern uh, definition. It's called software-defined vehicle. It's a vehicle that is designed and evolves around the software. It's like a smartphone. You are waiting for updates for, this, for your smartphone, giving you feature. This is the vehicle right now, OK? So vehicles are evolving and enhanced by software. So all of a sudden, tomorrow, you might have, you might have an updated feature in your car, giving you uh, a, new, a new fancy feature like autonomous driving or something like this. This is what the um, software-defined vehicle is about, OK? Also, for your information, Right now, you can have a car that is equated to 70 to 80 and even 90 computers on board, and they are all having a different functionality, OK? But this functionalities like um, lighting, access to the car, the address, uh, and the infotainment require communication. So they do communicate. They send lots of data in a fraction of a second, exchanging of map data, GPS, um, images from the camera, Images or information from sensor, rather, all of this are going to be exchanged in a fraction of a second. So we have lots of types here to exchange lots of objects. Okay, I'm defining my requirement for, for example, expressing a GPS location as a struct. For example, that's a type, and then objects of this type are being exchanged every millisecond, indicating a new position for my GPS on the map data. Okay. But then we have a problem here. So every single millisecond, we receive an immense data, and they are exchanged over network. So the idea here is that I would like to serialize, meaning that exchanging this object into bytes, OK? Serializing them in the, through the network, representing them in pure bytes, send them over the network, and receive them on the other computer. This is the goal here. So Serialization, as a definition, is the process of translating data structure or object state into a format that can be stored or exchanged over the network. Okay? And then what I need to do the, uh, afterwards is reconstruct later. It's very important. And the resulting series of bits is reread according to the serialization format, meaning that according to the byte, it's, uh, so that to the byte itself, it can be used to create a semantically identical clone. Okay? So this is very important. I should preserve an, ex an immense amount of safety here in, in order to recreate the object again. So what we need to do here? <clears throat> First, the problem that we receive uh, when we receive a communication through network is that we need to reshuffle the bytes. You know this ending this swap? OK? So we're going to imagine that we need to do it right now and see how safety can be or not be 
compromised in this way. It's very, very, very simple uh, example, maybe to you, but it will require a lot of skill as we're gonna see. So let's try to swap the Indianness. Let's do it in a classic way and see how safe that way is, and then we're gonna see a correct way. So anybody have tried before, or has tried before to uh, use this algorithm? It's very, very, very simple. Okay, as you can see here, we have a union. Okay, so imagine that T is a type that I would like to swap the byte. Okay, it's called um, byte reorder from big Indian to little Indian. Network functions in big Indian, meaning that the most significant bit is on the left, while our computers, our phones, have their least significant bit to the left, okay? And this is important because on x86 and R, they would like to have it to the left, the least significant one, in order to uh, make it easy for the addition, because when you do addition on bits, you start by the units, then tens, then hundreds and thousands. So it's very important to put them on the, on the left, okay? It will ease up the addition and multiplication and so forth. But when we read, we actually read from the left, we read the most significant, okay? One million, and then millions, thousands, and then hundreds, and then tens, and then units, okay? We are read from left to right. Network is a big Indian, meaning that the most significant bit is on the left, while our machines is the other way around. So we need to swap the byte here, okay? So imagine that in our example, in line four, as you can see in the comments here, we have a 32-bit, <coughs> Uh, sorry, 16 bit, but it's also non in binary. I can express it like this. Okay, and I, I should be having the swapping here. So the first byte, okay, should be swapped to the second byte. That's it. Okay, we'll do it through some trick using the union. Okay, so do you know union? How it works? What union is? Okay, great. So union is um, a very strange object, very strange type. It gives us the ability to having either of the types that I'm having in the union. So the union has two members, T, which is my potential type, okay, I'm passing here, and I have an array with this size of bytes. So do you understand the trick here? <clears throat> okay, so it's a classic C trick. And the <coughs> way it's done in, in, in C, it's trying to swap these two guys, meaning that I'm going to set it here, but I'm going to read it from here just to access to the underlying bytes, okay? Meaning that was constituting bytes of this type. And then I can do my for loop, exchange them, okay? And then returning the, uh, the my, my uh, swap file again here. So the problem is that I'm creating two instances of this union. And if in line 30, if you examine it quite thoroughly, you will find that I am setting to a union the number T, and then make it active. Active means, as I mentioned, union has a very strange feature. That means I, ha I should be having either of these two types, yet then at the same time. So I set the active member by writing to it. But when I set the active member, I am <coughs> attached to this member. I should be using this one. If I need to use the other one, I should make it active. And how can I make it active? I should write to it. So by writing, I am making this member as an active, and they, I should read from it. But in C, which is different from C++, can exchange them without setting the active member. And hence, we have here something that we can ex examine later on. Okay? Um, if this is clear, we can go to the next slide. So what I have done here, accessing unions, then active member, and then using the underlying bytes by this trick, okay, by going to the bytes of the type itself. In C++, it's undefined behavior, okay? Both of them. Why? In the union, in the specifications, this is a C++ 14 specification, by the way, in the union, at most, one of the non-static data members can be active at a time. The value of a, uh, of at most one of the non-static beta member, meaning that non-static members in the union should be active at a time. Second point here, if you imagine this uh, bullet, 
Finally, it's written that if the object is a union member or a solid object of the its lifetime only begins if the union member is initialized. Meaning that it's very important here. Let's get back to the example and then examine this one. So when I am setting to it, I'm starting lifetime. So in C++, it is undefined if I access the object outside of this lifetime. That's why it's undefined. Okay? The second problem I'm accessing what's called the underlying bytes is not standardized yet. I mean, this feature is that I reinterpret cost and int to a pointer of character, okay? As we're gonna see right now, in C it's defined. In C++ it's not defined. It's called accessing object representation. There was a paper, okay, by Tino Boomler. It was submitted for C++ 20 or 23, but it, it didn't make for both of them. That means we are hoping for 26. Till now, it's not a standard. I mean, it's not defined, okay? As you can see, the title of the paper is called Accessing the Object Representation, meaning that I would like to peek inside the, the underlying bytes. As is mentioned here, that this is valid in C, and it is widely used in C++. We are using it, but it's not defined behavior. Okay? And this is an example. For example, here, I can uh, alias any type, okay? Any type like an int or float double, to unsigned character pointer. This is, by the way, this is defined. I mean, this line is totally okay. The problem is access. Okay? Is that clear? This point is very important, okay? This is okay, because in the standard state that any type, I can look through it as if it is a pointer to a character, but not access it, okay? So that's the problem there. Okay, the problem can be solved here by min copy. I should use min copy to copy the pointer to what representation I would like, for example, like um, an array, array of bytes. And then I can use the index operator over my array of bytes. This is totally okay, okay? But there is one um, important thing here. There is a precondition. A precondition means something I should satisfy in order to have this feature, which is that this T must be a trivially copyable, okay? Trivially copyable means that its copy constructor is either defaulted, user defined me, okay? Or not uh, provided so that the compiler will be implicitly created for me, okay? This is very important. So, student copy, pay attention, this is very important. Does not start the last time, meaning that Whatever I'm copied from to, they should be already created, okay? According to CC++ 14, 17, but from 20 and 23, things have changed, okay? So, using student copy to copy bytes from object of type 1 to another object of type 2, where they are trivially copyable, but they don't share the same size, in the service, they share the same size, but they, there is no correspondence on the value between them, this is also undefined behavior. Pay attention to this. So, when, meaning that when I am copying from two, it's either from something the standard has uh, give me the right to do, like uh, as I mentioned, array of bytes and any type key, or type one, type two, just copying the data from here to here. Otherwise, it's undefined behavior. Okay, so we can use it, but with some precaution. <clears throat> And it's also is mentioned here. This is an example from the standard equation that I can use uh, for any object of trivial, trivial like copyable type T, whether or not the object holds the right value, making up the object can be copied into an array of characters or unsigned characters, meaning that unsigned int or signed int eight. If the content of the array or unsigned card is copied back in the object, I mean I have a fully um, a valid object and it matches exactly the original one, okay? So I can, right now, move it to the defined C++ side by using the main copy, as you can see. So what I'm doing here is actually I'm trying, I'm also fulfilling the align it, and using the align as, and creating an array of the same size of the type, okay, but in bytes, okay? This is allowed, I'm just aligning it 
to provide any uh, alignment requirement here, and then I can swap them according, okay? And then I can main copy back to a result and return it. I will have the same values. As a way, this example and the previous one, if you compile them, you will get the same binary code, the same assembly. You know why? I'm sorry? That's the compiler term, is whatever it was. Yes, and what it, the he, he said that the compiler can do whatever it wants, exactly. So when the, when the compiler encounters an indefined, undefined behavior, it can help me. So he is as if he is telling me, I got you covered here, I knew what you want to do, I'm going to cover you. But I'm not generating the code you want, I'm going to generate the correct thing. Okay, this happens a lot. <clears throat> so it's okay. So student copy should be used wisely, as we have mentioned. But there is one more thing here. We have something called the class invariant. So, okay, I'm having a trivially copyable object, okay? And I can copy between T and T, and the T1 and T2, and they are correctly aligned, they are representing the same type, or I'm copying from T to uh, a binary, uh, sorry, to um, an array of bytes, that is okay also. But I need to pay attention to something very important, which is the class invariant. We're going to talk about the class invariants right now. What is the class invariant? <laughs> so when I'm in copy between a class, object of class T, to another object of the same class T, I should pay attention to something called the class invariance here. The class invariance actually is the state of the class. Every class, every struct has a number of variables, okay? They represent the state of the class or the state of the struct. So, if I have, for example, a struct called semaphore light, okay, or traffic light, sorry. If I have a traffic light struct that represents a color, it has a color, okay? So the color is the invariant of my class or my struct here, the member, okay? I should preserve the state correctly with my operation. So I have, for example, set and get as the methods, then the set and get, to preserve correctly the state of this member variable, okay, or the member variables if I have many. So the definition says the values of the members and the objects referred to by members are collectively called the state of the object, okay? The major concern is that we need to preserve it in valid state. The initialization of the, by the constructor should do the initialization correctly to my members and preserving them and do the deletion or sorry, the cleanup in the destructor also in a valid way to be destroyed, to be destroyed with the object gracefully. The problem that makes the state of an object well defined is called the invariant. Okay, something I should preserve. Invariant means a sacred thing. An invariant for me meaning that something that is fixed, I should preserve it. Okay? An example here for the invariance. So as I mentioned, the traffic light struct, it has a color, and pay attention to the color, it is an enum. An enum is based on or its underlying type is called unsigned AT, okay? It's a type unsigned A. But it cannot accept any unsigned A. It's only three things, okay? I'm denoting or giving a red 100, orange 110, and green 120, for example, okay? So it's not every possibility for that, not the 255, but just three of them, okay? Can I, in this case, copy an object from traffic light to other one? Or meme set? Or do you know the meme sets? Meme compare? They are the priority, the, um, the browser of the meme copy, okay? Setting and comparing, okay? So in this sense, if I am setting, if I call meme sets on the address of this object, okay? setting it by zero with the size of the light, I evaluate the class invariant. You know why? Because this guy will be set to zero. There is no zero in my range, correct? So I am violating the invariant here. Another example is very important. When I do student copy, here I have a constraint in this stuff, okay? So, if I'm copying from an object of the same type, ref int and ref int, okay, what I'm going to end up with, 
I'm going to write on my corners. Okay, it will compile. Does it make any sense? No. I'm violating also the class invariant here. For this particular issue, there is a specific warning in GCC called class minimizers. You should be activating this uh, warning and you're gonna be surprised, okay? It warns me when the distribution of the call of a Roman, a Roman uh, memory function is either mem copy, mem set, mem move, mem compare. All of these are called Roman memory function, such as mem set or mem copy. And when writing into such an object, not bypass the class non trivial operative destructor. So think of this <clears throat> I'm having a constructor, okay? A trivial constructor, a non trivial constructor. So what the constructor is doing is actually initializing, but he also may manipulate the object according to some logic. Okay? He can set all the values to my int just to have a threshold. If the int is is receiving a parameter to initialize my int, and the constructor in the parameter sees that the int is, for example, exceeding 100, I can make if more than 100, set it to less than 100. So I'm, I'm exerting or I am doing some manipulation in the initialization through the constructor here. When I do the min copy, okay, the compiler can cannot see through my uh, constructor. So it's very important to have a trivially copyable or trivially object in order to use the copy. Another thing is that the copy assignment. If I'm having a specific copy assignment, then I cannot do min copy. For that, we find the representation of such object may violate invariance maintained by member function of the class. Okay? And also might violate the const correctness. And actually this example here, in line 13, it ends up with this warning from the GCC. So then uh, the GCC issues a diagnostic message, which is a warning, okay, telling me that I, I might ruin or violate the, um, the invariant of my class, okay? Finally, stupid copy, stupid set, and mean compare, they are very efficient, but they perform their operation with object representation. Okay, what is the object representation of an object T? Meaning that for every structure or class, it has an object representation. All of the bytes present the object, including adding. Okay, this is the definition. Let's run to the, to the example to see what I mean by padding, padding here. So I have a struct and it has three members. One of them is eight bytes and the other is the first two one are just two bytes. So the padding requirement or the alignment requirement will force the alignment of this full stack to be aligned on eight bytes, occupying 16 bytes of data instead of 12, because I have four bytes lost for padding, okay? So min copy copies this min uh, padding bytes for me. Min set will set the padding bytes for me. Min compare will compare the value of the bytes representing the values like unsigned 16 and size t, but also will compare the padding as well. Does that make any sense? Okay. So in this in this um, example, I'm having two with two innocents f1, f2. They are by the aggregate initialization aggregate initialization they are initialized to zero. Okay. So equivalently, they should be the same, holding the same value. But according to mean compare, they are not. And this assertion will fail, meaning that the mean compare cannot see them identical because the padding bytes can might have random values. Okay. Last thing here, <clears throat> we have also, if I instead of using the mean compare using um, the comparison operator, this assertion passes. Meaning that I have, uh, I'm doing my operation on uh, the object representation or the value representation. So in the other example, it was object, last one, it was the value representation, the value of the members themselves. So we need to distinguish between object representation and value representation. Need to pay attention to class invariant, but still 
may result in unsafe operations. So, any questions? Yeah, uh, the good point they were funny, it is part of the other people's explanation. Okay. 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 The printer. I'm sorry? Uh -huh. Let's say now uh, it is. It is there. Yes. 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 It's part of the option. Yes. Okay. So the question was in virtual classes. So if I have a both class with virtual method and I have uh, a child class that inherits this base, uh, base uh, class. I have a hidden uh, member inside my uh, class called a virtual table for both of them. And uh, sorry, it's a virtual pointer that points to the virtual table, okay? And when I do min compare or min copy, I'm removing actually the virtual. Uh, that's why these operations are so trivial or trivially copyable. And both of this means no virtual at all, okay? No inheritance should be used. Sorry, in other words, should not be used here nor uh, as an aristotle class, nor as a virtual method, okay? So pay attention to the trivial and trivial call. Any questions? I'm a beginner for the and um, I'm uh, to start in learning about it. And I, I remember what you've said before about undefined behavior. Mm -hmm. What I got that, while the program is running, there is no way that I can know that a program wait in an undefined state. state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My question is, uh, because I also uh, saw that there's a movement um, with the 26 uh, yeah. version. Is there um, any clear direction? Um, you say, are we getting into a place where we would actually know that uh, a program went out in an undefined uh, the state? I've been reading about Rust, and I got to know that they're trying to do something similar by using ownership. Is mm -hmm. um, Rust interested in doing anything similar? Okay, so the question basically, uh, since we have touched uh, some points like undefined behavior uh, regarding memory types and comparison to Rust. So Rust, it was born to be safe, safe types, safe memory access, and also safe from the ownership. Uh, the question was, is, are there some directions regarding the new version of C++ to catch up with Rust is offering? I believe for the current time, no. But um, if you head to C++ conference 2022, there was, uh, the, I guess it was the opening talk by Herb Satter. He was trying to port one, some of this Rust into something called CDP2. So CDP2 represents the second generation, okay? So uh, um, he wanted C++ to be within your time safer than the current one and also faster by offering what you mentioned, like ownerships and memory safe and type safe from Rust. But right now, no. Another direction, not Rust, by Carbon from Google, it's new language, it's also Giving something in between C++ and Rust, so it's C++ compatible. You are not going to lose your legacy code, but also you can gain some safety from the Rust. It's called Carbon. Okay, very strange name, but I guess to pun on Rust. <clears throat> you know why? Okay, because Carbon, when you when it's added to steel, it will prevent rusting. So yeah, something to uh, pun on. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.